we'd like to welcome you to this webinar that we are holding to mark a and awareness month and i would like to first of all uh, use some housekeeping rules we are not using the q and a the chat button and that can be accessed by the icons at the bottom of your screen the third from the right is the chat button we will only be answering questions at the end of the talk. For those of you who can't find the chat button, relax, you don't have to get excited. You can also send your questions via email to me, Claudette Medifant, but the email address is claudette at retinasa.org.za. And if you would like to send a WhatsApp message, you can WhatsApp to 083 306 5262. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to myself. I'm Claudette Medifant. I'm the Head of Science of Retina South Africa. This webinar this afternoon has been organized by our Port Elizabeth office and uh, we'd like to pay tribute to their efficient working and organization of this webinar. They have also managed to get CPD accreditation. So again, if you want CPD accreditation, you can send an email to that email address, claudette at retinasa.org.za, and you will be told how to go about applying for CPD points. You can only get CPD points if you are registered for the webinar. Although the webinar will be recorded and be available on the Retina South Africa YouTube channel, you cannot get CPD points by just watching a YouTube. I'm afraid it's not that easy. We're also going to have a survey at the end, and we would like you to answer some questions on the survey. So without further ado, I would like to welcome you again and introduce you to our panel, Dr. Lowe, who is an ophthalmologist at the Port Elizabeth Provincial Hospital, our clinic, and Dr. Olivia Reed, who was at the uh, PE Provincial Hospital, our clinic, until 2017 but is now in private practice. Benjamin Liss, who's a lower vision optometrist in Nelson Mandela Bay. Our host, Gail Sinney, who you will hear from at the end, and me, Claudette Medifant. Most of all, and of course, a big thank you and uh, yeah. welcome to our keynote speaker, yeah. Corin Denton. And Corin Denton has got such a long CV that we actually need a special webinar yeah. just for her CV. Yeah. So yeah. suffice yeah. to say, she is one of the most natural and gifted public speakers that I've ever encountered. And she's really great. Her knowledge is vast. She spent most of her academic life studying and learning about diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Uh, and that would be the subject of a future webinar. But today she's going to concentrate on her other passion, which is age-related macular degeneration. She's the wonderful speaker and is so knowledgeable and is the, one of the rare finds to people who are happy to share her knowledge. So Corin, I'm going to ask you to share your screen and please remember that your questions will be answered at the end, whether they come via the chat or via email or via WhatsApp. And don't get excited if you don't get an answer, we will answer you even if it is after the webinar. Over to you, Corin. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Claudette. You kind of intimidate me here and I would also like to thank Gail for setting this up and I hope that this little talk will mean a lot to a lot of people. I want to point out that this talk is geared at what we at Retina do when we're involved in our education responsibilities. As you know we do a lot of things at Retina, we do counselling, advocacy, which we're very strong in, and also a lot of education. And this talk is just an example of the type of information that we will impart to people. It is obviously individually varied according to need. So let's then have a look. We're going to talk about living with the aging eye, what you need to know. I have mentioned that we are part of Retina South Africa and we do all kinds of wonderful things. 
we are not a very big team countrywide, but we are very effective. By way of full disclosure, I want to make very clear that this program is made possible thanks to an unconditional grant from Bayer, South Africa. I'm going to start by telling you about a few important concepts that people sometimes confuse or not aware of. For those of you who can, have a look at this picture, and I'm sure that you'll be able to see that there is a cheetah. That is vision. Vision means you are able to interpret the surroundings using the light in the visible spectrum that's reflected back to your eye by different objects. But you'll also hear your eye care team talking about visual acuity. So what is visual acuity then? In a nutshell, it means how well you can see. So the difference between that cheetah, which you can see, and the visual acuity that is enhanced in this one shows how well you can see. So when you hear your optometrist or your ophthalmologist or any of your eye care team banding these words around, that is what they mean. If we look at the eye, this is just the most amazing organ. And the way it works is quite miraculous. And I'd love to be able to spend an entire hour and a half just going through that. But I'm just going to talk about the most important concepts. Light comes into the eye through the cornea. It goes through the um, pupil, the lens, through the eye. And then it hits the retina at the back of the eye. And there, all these little light impulses collect from what you're looking at. For example, the picture that I have there. And that little picture travels along the optic nerve into the occipital area. Usually there are other areas in the brain where it is interpreted as that picture. And that entire process happens literally in the blink of an eye. If you close your eyes and then open them, you can see immediately. And that entire process has happened in that time. However, if there's a breakdown anywhere along this pathway, anywhere at all, in the eye, along the nerve, in the brain itself, we do have a loss of vision. But the one type of loss of vision that we're talking about today that affects the central part of the retina is macular degeneration. A quick look just to tell you about a little bit more about the retina. I'm not going to say much, just that it is a very amazing, complex sandwich. And every single layer is important for good vision. Now, when we look at things, there are all kinds of aspects that are so important. Some of the tasks we use, use the central cones. Now, the central cones are towards the middle of the retina, the macular area. And that is where you focus and use your sharp vision. Other tasks use the peripheral areas around so that you can still see that even though it is not as finely focused as what you see with the central part. And then they tasks that use both, both the central cones and the peripheral rods. So let's have a look. For fine focus, like reading, writing, computer, embroidery, sewing, all of those things that you do, you use the central cones so if there's damage to those central cones, that is where you will have a problem with vision. You'll have a problem with fine focus. Distance vision, however, uses both rods and cones. Color vision uses three types of cones. And in our eyes, we have red, green, and blue, except for a family that they've identified, I think, in Spain, who have four types of color cones. Very interesting. And if you have a problem with red, green, or blue, you can have the different types of color blindness. 
because all color is a mixture of red, green, and blue. For depth perception, you need both your eyes. And I don't know if you've ever had to close one eye and try to drive with it or reach out and pick up a pen or something like that. It really is difficult. You need both eyes for depth perception. Contrast vision is so very important. And with people with limited vision, we try to get you to enhance your area as much as possible to create as much contrast as you can so that you can see, for example, if you have rice on your plate. Then movement uses rods, then cones, and then rods again as it moves along. And night vision depends on the rods. So if you have a problem in the peripheral area of your eye, the surrounding area, not the central part, you will have very poor or no night vision. Now, testing vision, we normally test visual acuity. And this is the measure of your eye to see the detail as opposed to the whole picture. So let's have a look at a little bit more about that. You'll probably be very familiar with one of these charts that your optometrist or ophthalmologist would use to test your visual acuity. And I'm just going to say one thing about this when we stop here. Please understand that this is not a pass mark. You are not going to be graded. You're not going to get a bigger salary according to how well you can do on this acuity test. And I'm saying this because more than once, I've been in the presence of people. Um, for example, I was in an optometry practice last year, and I happened to notice in the room opposite that the optometrist was called out for something fairly urgent. And while she was gone, the lady went up to the chart and quickly memorized a few lines and then sat down. And when the optometrist came back, she said, oh, I could read DVO, okay, she, I, O, H, B, C, K. That doesn't help anybody. And then, sadly, if you give them the wrong pair of glasses, you're not going to blame yourself. You will say, what a terrible optometrist that was that gave me a formula that didn't work. So, Always say exactly what you can and can't see. There are lots of causes of vision loss, but we're just going to highlight a few of the important ones. Refractive error, are you long or short-sighted, etc. Cataracts, and they are age-related cataracts, senile cataracts, but also diabetes cataracts that affect a lot of people in this country. Glaucoma. The one we're talking about today is age-related macular degeneration, what will be um, uh, retinite as pigmentosa. And then, as Claudette mentioned, we'll be talking about diabetic retinopathy later on because the prevalence, incidence, and new cases of diabetic retinopathy are off the scale. It, and unfortunately, many of these people are diagnosed when they already have eye damage, that can be a presenting symptom. Now, let's look at age-related macular degeneration then in a little more detail. It is a leading cause of irreversible visual loss in the Western world in people aged 50 to 60 plus. So that's me. There are more than 200 million people affected worldwide. And in the USA alone, there are more than 11 million affected. We know that the prevalence is around 5% for people 50 and older, and more than 12% for people getting to the age of 80. But this increases every single year. So what goes wrong? We have a fairly descriptive name here. Age-related means it's related to as we get older. Macula is the central part of the retina and degeneration means it's degenerating, it's not working, it's destroyed. And we are going to look at an overall picture of this progressive eye condition 
that affects the central part of the retina for so many people. The causes are multiple, and we will look at them. We know that there are certain genetic mutations, and they create horrible proteins that cause the death of those retinal cells. So if you have macular degeneration, or if someone in your family has, it is so important to be screened, and I'm going to mention this again, to be screened once a year for this problem because your doctor can pick this up years, years, years before you are aware of the first symptom. So what happens then is in the retina, these little things form that we call drusen and your doctor can see them when he looks into your retina, onto the eye. But as I've just said, you'll be unaware that they're there until there are so many and they've clumped together so much that it's interfering with your vision. So it is important for anyone who has a family history with AMD or has reached the age of 50 or over to have that annual eye checkup, just as you have your dental checkup. So who's at risk? Anyone then who's getting older, so that's all of us. And in a study that they did two years ago in the United States, they actually found that one in 14 people over the age of 40 have signs and symptoms of AMD. So we need to jump around. The other risk factors are smoking, family history, high blood pressure, pale eye color, obesity and inactivity, and those of us who are Caucasian females, sorry guys, we're in trouble. I've got blue eyes and I'm Caucasian female, I'm at high risk. And then air pollution has been shown to be a major factor. So if you live in an area, this is actually Johannesburg taken last year one morning. And as you can see, we live in a high risk area. And as an example of the kind of person who is at risk, Dame Judy Dench has become quite an ambassador for macular degeneration. So, but there are other risks as well. First is overexposure to sunlight. Now we live in a country where we have the most glorious sunlight. We have beautiful sunny days, long days, and it is important for you to have exposure to that sunlight, but the trick is when, and I'll tell you quickly, as long as your shadow is longer than you are, you are safe to go in the sun. But Whenever you go into the sun, you must wear UV protection because the type of light coming from the sun is damaging to the retina. And it's a similar light to what we have coming from our devices, from TVs, from computers. So always protect yourself. But do go in the sun because you need that vitamin D to maintain the integrity and health of every single cell in your body, including your eye cells, including your retinal cells. So dietary factors, the, this is so important. This is another one I can spend an entire day talking. You need a diet with sufficient antioxidants. So to cut it very short, I'm just gonna tell you, if you can eat a diet, that represents every color of the rainbow every single day, you are doing a huge amount to protect yourself. And the most important thing there is green leafy vegetables, lots of spinach, lots of kale, things like that. We also know that there's certain drugs that can cause problems. So if you're on anything and if you're in the high risk category, Always discuss your medication with both the doctor that puts you onto the medication and 
your optometrist and ophthalmologist. In other words, what we're saying here is AMD is not one simple thing. Macular degeneration isn't from this, this, this or this. It is an interrelated, interconnected host of factors. It's your genes, it's your environment, it's what you eat, it's your age, it's your biology, it's what you do, it's your exercise, it's everything. It is a combination of both your genetic and environmental factors. So we mentioned earlier that when you have degeneration of the cells in the center of the retina, this is the area responsible for your central vision or your sharp vision where you focus. This is responsible for reading, writing, watching TV, driving, recognizing faces, sewing, what, all, all those things that you need to look at in detail. Loss of central vision means you're not going to be able to see that central part, although the surrounding will probably be quite intact. And in these two pictures, on the left-hand side is um, just a normal picture of two kids together. And on the right is the same scene viewed with someone who has quite advanced severe AMD. Now, there are two types of macular degeneration. There's dry, also known as non-neovascular, and wet, known as neovascular. And I'm going to just quickly tell you that neovascular relates to the growth of new blood vessels in the body where they should not be. Now, your body's very good at doing this. If your body detects an area in the heart, in the eye, wherever it is, that needs a little bit of extra oxygen, nutrients, and needs to have that rubbish taken away, it will create new blood vessels to go there. These vessels in the eye are terrible. They're just like the South African roads. They're full of potholes. They leak, they break, they cause problems. They're, they're absolutely horrific. So we don't want them there. And once again, who's going to know that they're there? Only your ophthalmologist who looks at your retina. So another reason to get there really promptly, effectively, quickly. Dry AMD is the most common type. It is more common, about 80 to 90 percent of people. It is recognized now as an, probably an earlier stage of AMD. And it is aging or thinning of the macula. And it is diagnosed, as I said, very early when those drusen appear that are only those yellow spots are only visible in the beginning to your doctor who looks into that retina and can see it. You have gradual central vision loss and very rarely is it rapid with a degra degradation into geographic atrophy, which, which is quite severe, but we'll talk about that also on another day. Wet AMD is about 10% of people with dry AMD may progress to wet AMD. In this, those horrible new blood vessels form beneath the retina. They are friable, they are nasty, they're going to rupture, they're going to leak, they're going to bleed, they're going to cause all kinds of damage. The problem with AMD is that it is so asymptomatic for many, many, many years. And I cannot stress enough how important it is for you to get your family to go and be checked if you have any AMD in your family. It is slow, it is painless, it is very rarely sudden. You might pick up shadowy areas in the central vision or a bit of fuzzy vision or distorted vision. And I find that very often when I speak to people, they say, oh, I thought it was just my eyes getting a bit old. Yes, your eyes are getting old, but they're getting macular degeneration. So if there's any change, go to the doctor. The other signs and symptoms, you, you might have increased glare sensitivity and people then prefer to stay indoors. Also, decreased color perception and instead of seeing <clears throat> an image in full color, it is seen kind of washed out. And 
I want to stress here that usually 99% of the time, the peripheral vision is unaffected, which means that very rarely will, will someone with AMD go completely blind because that peripheral vision will be intact. Now, what happens when we do diagnostics? First of all, your healthcare professional takes a full history. They want to know everything about your cardiac history, your diabetes history, everything that's gone before. They'll then use an ophthalmoscope to gaze deeply into your eye. They'll do the visual acuity test that we mentioned earlier and that you're going to be very honest about. They can also do a dilated um, eye exam, which will detect AMD much, much, much earlier. And then we use an AMSLA grid. And I'll talk about the AMSLA grid a little bit more later. But just to point out that using the AMSLA grid, you close first one eye and then the other. You do the eyes one by one. And closing one, you gaze at that central black spot and just check that the surrounding lines are all equally spaced, equally dark, equally parallel, they're not wavy, they're not going funny, but I'll show you more about that. They can also take a photograph of your fundus. OCT, OCT is um, a way that they are able to look at the layers of your retina and find out exactly what's going on. Exactly the same as in art, they use OCT. For example, they did in the Mona Lisa to see what lies beneath the layers that we can now see of the Mona Lisa on, on top. So they use OCT to examine photographs and retinas. And your doctor then can get a very nice picture of the layers of the retina and see exactly what is going on in all important areas of the retina. And then fluorescein angiography, and I'm sure that you possibly have had this done as well with the blood vessels in the retina or shown up and any areas. Just a word again about the AMSLA grid. Um, we make sure that the lines are parallel, equally spaced, etc., and they don't have dark spots, wavy, missing areas, etc., and no shadows. And in fact, the AMSLA grid can tell us quite a lot about the progression of eyesight. And it is very important for people over the age of 50 and for anyone with AMD especially to have an AMSLA grid at home and check your eyes every week, possibly maybe twice a week, just to make sure that there are no changes happening. And the moment there are any changes, you dash back to your eye care specialist immediately. Treatments then. Early detection and intervention is very, very important. We know that we have these eye injections these days for wet AMD, and I'll talk a little bit more about them, because we are looking, they're doing trials, on injections for dry AMD as well. Long-term follow-up is essential with counselling and support, and you need for good care. You need that entire team. You need your ophthalmologist, your optometrist, your psychologist, orientation mobility specialist to help you to adapt as you go, your occupational therapist, and of course, Retina South Africa to help you with counseling, education, give you information, and um, to give you news and research that could be happening. And if you're part of Retina South Africa, you will know before anybody else. And your lifestyle, of course, is very, very important. I'm going to just say a word or two about those anti-VEGF injections, the eye injections that we spoke about. At the moment, there are three on the market. Now, we know that people react differently to different meds, especially in this kind of medication, anti-VEGF. And we know that some people respond to the one and some to the other. So if you are not getting a good response after about three injections, it might be worth thinking of switching to one of the others. I know that they often say that cost is a limiting factor 
But because the other injections can be given spaced as much as three or four months apart, when you take the total cost into consideration, it actually turns out to be exactly the same. And then we were quite excited because a fourth anti-VEGF was launched onto the market last year, but is currently possibly being withdrawn because they are picking up major problems with it. So we need to just keep an eye on what is happening with that one. It would be nice to have a fourth available, however, because then it just means that people have an extra option. You must control everything else. All the other diseases that your doctor is treating for you must be looked after. Lifestyle is very important, as we said. No smoking. Limit your drinking. These days, we do take um, products that contain lutein and zeaxanthin, which are known to be very protective of the retina. And control your weight and exercise is very important. And this is where we're picking up problem, major problems at the moment with the COVID problem, is that people are not exercising to the extent that they did before. So it's very important. And it doesn't matter what age you are, you can still exercise. Your diet, as we said earlier, if you can eat from every color of the rainbow every single day, that would be fantastic. And then I'm just going to say a word about oranges because this study really attracted me. It was done in Australia over a couple of years involving 16,000 people. And they found that there is a product called hesperidine found only in oranges and only in those little cells in the orange. And if people have one orange a day, it can be up to 60% protective of the retina as well. They had 60% less development into AMD when people had one orange a day. So obviously, if you're going to take the orange juice, it needs to be one with the full pulp. You know, the one that says with cells, those ones. Other things that are important, you do need to know about what low vision aids are available. And there, once again, we can help you at Retina South Africa. We know exactly where to refer you. We can tell you what is available. We can tell you what is free. We can tell you where you can access all kinds of things. We mentioned UV protection when you're in the sun, when watching TV or any of your devices. Lighting and contrast is very important for you, and there are professionals who can help you in your home. And we've mentioned that regular follow-up with your team is really important. Dry AMD, currently we, we use an ARIDS 2 formula, no longer the ARIDS. There are a few on the market, and they contain lutein and zeaxanthin. And people, the reason I've included this is people often say to me, what's the difference between the lutein and the complete? The lutein is what you take if you're also on a blood thinner. So if you happen to be on a blood thinner and you need Occuvite, you need to take the, the, the lutein Occuvite. And then we have a new machine that they're trying to introduce into South Africa. It's very popular in Europe and the UK called the Maya, and I will show it to you in a moment. There are also in the future new drugs being developed all the time for both dry and wet macular degeneration. The amount of research and development is mind-boggling, and more and more people are getting involved. The new drug delivery advices, and some are already available. For example, there's a tiny little thing, it's, it's minute, that they can plant into the eye with your um, anti-VEGF in it, and it only needs to be refilled once or twice a year. So that really helps a huge amount. Photocoagulation has gone largely out of favor, although I believe it is still being used in certain areas. On new diagnostics, there are all kinds of wonderful ways that we can look at the eye and diagnose things really early. And then we've mentioned rehabilitation new ways of working, new ways of getting things in your office, etc., etc. And then I mentioned the Maya machine, which is quite a miraculous machine. In this, 
they use this machine to, when your macular cells are being destroyed, it's not the whole macula that's gone, it's certain areas. So they retrain the areas that are still intact to be able to see and to be able to take over the function of focusing. And that is really working well. And then last but not least, I want to remind you that if every single person that you know with AMD or a family member who has a retinal condition, they should register with Retina South Africa. Because as I said earlier, we offer research, we offer counseling, education, exactly what we're doing now, and a host of other services as well. If you have any further questions that you haven't been able to get through to us, please send them to gail at retinasouthafrica.org.za. Thank you. Wonderful, Karen. Thank you very much. And may I just correct you there that the email address is gail at retinasa.org.za. Didn't I say that? You said Retina South Africa. <laughs> written our song. <laughs> yeah, that was a wonderful presentation. Yeah, it's and I'd like now to uh, ask Dr. Reed, Dr. Lowe, and uh, Mr. Benjamin List to unmute themselves and uh, be available for questions. Um, so, first of all, we have uh, from my side, I've got a very important question, but I've never had the opportunity of having such a prestigious panel to, to ask from. Ask this question of Dr. Lowe, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, you are still muted and you can certainly put your cameras on if you like. Um, let me just see. Um, yeah, so we can have Dr. Lowe unmuted. Dr. Reed is unmuted and Benjamin Liss is unmuted. So it's, it's just Dr. Lowe that needs to unmute his mic. Oh, he, so he for, might be on at an emergency or something. So maybe Dr. Reed could answer. Okay, so on my side, well, let's first see what's on the chat. So we have a very uh, interesting question uh, about, um, and I'm trying to open the chat now. What so progress is there with chloroquine maculopathy? That's right. So I think uh, for the, the question uh, we're going, to, the person has asked, um, what is the progress in treating chloroquine maculopathy? Can you hear me? Yes, there's that Dr. Reed. Yes, hi. Hello, Dr. Reed. Thank you hi, so much how are for you? joining. We're so pleased that you could join our panel. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. Karen, thank you very much for an excellent and informative talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. That, that's what your patients hear from us. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, with, with regards to uh, chloroquine uh, maculopathy, um, you know, as far as I know that, you know, there isn't any, any treatment for, for it. The risks nowadays are relatively low because most people are using hydroxychloroquine as opposed to chloroquine, um, where the risk of, of developing the maculopathy is, is, is much lower. As far as I remember, it's about 1% after five to, to seven years. We've lost you, Dr. Reed. Oh, she's disappeared now completely. I think we have lost Dr. Reed. Uh, yes. Find her. Oh, right. yes she's uh, is Dr. Lowe with us? As far as I know, it's the um, hydrochloroquine, the old fashioned hydrochloroquine that actually causes maculopathy, and also some of the arthritic drugs. Corin? I, be I believe that is correct. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask a question, and, and I don't know if Dr. Dr. Reed is back in again. I just want to check uh, if we've had any uh, questions by email. I only had a question about CPD points. And as I said, uh, people who are registered can just email either Gail or Claudette at retinasa.org.za, and you will be told how you can access those CPD points. I've got a question for Dr. Lowe, Dr. Reed, and in maybe even Benjamin. We know that AMD is less prevalent in our black population, but 
We also know that other areas north of, in the North Africa, like Kenya and um, certainly Nigeria, they do have a higher prevalence of, of uh, AMD in, in their black population. Has anybody got any, any ideas on that, Benjamin? Uh, Corin, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, no, I, unfortunately, I don't have uh, any ideas, but perhaps it could be geographic like it is, like you oh, see with, uh, with, with other conditions. So that's what I would assume, that uh, there, there may be a geographic element to, to AMD. But you are quite right. It, it, it is not prevalent amongst our black population in South Africa. I, I have read that it's more common amongst the Nguni people, which are the majority of the blacks in South Africa. It's more common or less common? Oh, I beg your pardon. It is less common among the Nguni people. Benjamin, uh, is there anything you would like to add to, from a purely uh, rehabilitation point of view about AMD? And, and I know the remarkable um, gain in quality of life that people with AMD do gain when they have vision rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so certainly there, there is a, there is so much one can do t today with uh, simple, maybe just reading glasses or magnifiers, which we've been doing for years, as well as the uh, telescopic uh, lenses if required. And then um, there's all the new, uh, the new electronic and digital stuff that that is now available. And um Certainly, I mean, this is uh, this can make a significant difference to uh, someone's lifestyle with with regards to uh, um, devices, low vision aids, or even just uh, as, as spectacles. I know, for example, that um, the the apps that you now get free on most uh, yes. smartphones, particularly on I'm an iPhone fan, so. I'm afraid Apple's not giving us any money for this punch, but um, I'm, I'm an iPhone fan and an iPad fan, and I, I know that there's so much that's available free, and we have Correct. Steve Jobs to thank for that. But also on the other on the other phones, um, there are you know built-in magnifiers, or you get that little moving loop on your phone so you can read telephone numbers, you get voiceover, and Gail, perhaps you'd like to unmute yourself because I know Gail is a user. While we wait for Gail, can I quickly answer a question that um, came privately? It was to comment on Charles Bonnet syndrome. Charles Bonnet syndrome is very, very underreported because what it is, is when the macula, when the cells in the eye don't focus properly, the brain tries to fill in what it's seeing, and you start seeing things that aren't there. Now, people are terrified of this because they think that maybe they're going a bit crazy. It does get worse with stress. So we have found a massive increase in numbers of people with Charles Bonnet syndrome in the past year with um, COVID and lockdown and isolation and all that. And most of the time, it resolves itself within a few months. So I think people just need to know that it is a fairly, if you can call it normal process that happens in the eye. Maybe Benjamin would like to comment on that as well, but it's nothing to be afraid of. And just know that it's happening to a lot of people out there and it will go away. Those little visions, those little shapes. Yes, I, th I think you're right. We, we, we will see uh, uh, a, a lot more of this with, re with regards to um, patients coming forward now after COVID. Um, and, uh, and as you say, it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a common problem that we hear of every day, but I'm sure it's, uh, Corin, you're quite right there. It's very, very un underdiagnosed. I, I, I somehow also think that maybe patients are not willing to come forward and, and mention this to you in the examination for the fear of thinking that perhaps, you know, you know, one, one may think that they are going a little uh, uh, 
crazy, so to speak. But uh, yes, it is very unfortunate. It is, uh, it is uh, it's something that you just don't hear a lot about. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think also what, what I, when we, I have someone with, who reported with Charles Barnet, and it doesn't only happen in macular degeneration, it can happen with any type of vision loss. We are actually advise them to, to find a stress management regime that works for them, breathing, you know, relaxation techniques, et cetera, which does seem to, um, to alleviate them. And we had a, a, a patient with severe retinitis pigmentosa who used to see little trains and the trains came training in, came, came into the, the, the lounge and they'd stop and the little green men would jump out of the train and run around the room. And when I explained to him about, Star about Charles Bonnet, I understood and I said to him, you know, you've got, to, you've got to calm the mind and the mind is actually in control and you have to manage these visual hallucinations. And he phoned me about a month later and he said, I actually, we actually saved him from having him committed. His family thought he was crazy. And it's, it's wonderful, they've stopped. And I said to him, what did you do? And he said, when the trains came in, I told them the station was closed <laughs> and they went away. But now I've discovered a lot of people have been using the Q&A and perhaps we could look at some of those. Catherine has said, is there any treatment for star guards? Well, we're not talking about star guards in this, this program, Catherine, but we will be handling it in a future webinar. But we will also get your email address and answer you um, privately but just very shortly to say, yeah, there are many treatments for star guards, both gene therapy and also with visual disruptor drugs. And there is actually a trial that we are participating in South Africa. And to be on that trial, you need to be a member of Retina South Africa and have a genetic diagnosis. And then Mohammed has said, thank you for the presentation. Is there any treatment for retinitis pigmentosa? And again, uh, this retinitis pigmentosa is not actually being handled in this, this session. But again, you need to join Retina South Africa. And yes, as Corin has spoken about different types of uh, supplements that can slow the rate of degeneration or the conversion from dry to wet AMD, there are also supplements uh, that contain lutein, zeaxanthin, alpha lipoic acid, and L-glutathione that we know do slow the rate of degeneration in retinitis pigmentosa. So please contact us, Claudette, at retinasa.org.za. And from wherever you are, there is a, uh, you can order from the suppliers and they do supply internationally. Dave has said, what is the latest stem cell research? So, um, I think we have to have a special <laughs> program on research. Stem cell research is holds the promise, like perhaps uh, gene editing, of making the biggest difference to the treatment of neurodegenerative conditions. But stem cell is in its infancy. And there are many clinical trials that are ongoing, particularly those on AMD, Perhaps you want to answer that one, Corin. Um, the stem cell research is carrying on. Um, the, the, in fact, there are quite a few going on. The most important thing that they're looking at there is how to control the cells when they're implanted into the retina. But by and large, it is looking promising. And I know, Claudette, you always say within five years, <laughs> I have. I can't imagine anything longer than five years. <laughs> I I tend to be more optimistic and say, I'm hoping that this would be available sooner than that. But also, um, at the moment, if I remember, it's quite prohibitively expensive, isn't it, Claudette? Well, there's nothing that's available at the moment. It's still yeah. in all in research. Yeah. But of course, I think what the distinction we need to make between dry and wet AMD is that dry AMD is actually a disease of the pigment epithelium. Yeah. That is where the drusen first grows. So a lot of the successful stem cells are yeah. looking at, at producing or growing new retinal pigment epithelium. Now that is an easier task yeah. than growing new photoreceptors because yeah. photoreceptors are neural cells. 
And we know that neural cells are very difficult to maintain in the body, even by the body, let alone to grow with stem cells. And there has been a lot of success in growing retinal pigment, epi, uh, retinal pigment epithelium. And then somebody asked about star guards earlier as well. And interestingly enough, some of the research will actually, the star guard research will piggyback on the AMD research because star guards is also a disease of the pigment epithelium. And for very different reasons, they, uh, star guards actually get a waste product called a lipofuscin in the pigment epithelium. And star guards disease, well, actually a lot of the treatment will piggyback. We hope that will be because for every one person who's got star guards, you've got a hundred at least who've got AMD. So it makes it financially more viable for people who are investing in research to look at something that will help AMD. So yeah, AMD is um, progressing. And I would suggest that you look at our website, www.retinasa.org.za. And also a very good uh, website is www.fightingblindness.org. They've got a lot of really important and up-to-date information on research. Then we've also got from SUNA, injection for dry AMD. Is it being done in South Africa? No. No, it's still not anyway. No. It's, it's still in clinical trial. Clinical cell. So it's still being it's still being I think it's in phase two clinical trials at the moment. So sooner, no, there is no, no treatment as such. The only thing that anybody with dry AMD of course is to go on to product like Ocuvite to actually stop the conversion from dry to wet AMD. Angelina uh, Coopy from the National Council for the Blind is the list of professionals to take care of someone with AMD. You included an occupational therapist. How do they help the patient? And perhaps, Corin, you could answer that one. Oh, we should have had an occupational therapist on. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they help the patient to adapt to absolutely everything that they do in their lives because when your vision is impacted and you're unable to, for example, cook or do things that you used to before, they'll be able to assist you to show you how to adapt your home, your lifestyle, your everything into a way that facilitates your lifestyle to the best possible way. And also, if you're still working, they can help you with um, adapting to that. Also, you can't just, for example, go to the nearest pharmacy and buy yourself a, a magnifier, for example. It's just like going and buying yourself a random pair of glasses and wondering why they don't work. All of these things need a professional to help and assist. And there are so many low vision devices available um, to help with reading, to help with sewing, to help with everything. And the occupational therapist, in other words, helps you to live your life to the best possible degree. And then, Claudette, there's a very nice message from Dr. Koch. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you, Dr. Koch. He is the president of the South African Vitria Retinal Society and a staunch supporter of Retina South Africa. And we really need to thank him and his entire committee for all the support they've given us in our advocacy to make the, uh, to ensure that the medical funders do give fair and equitable access to treatment. And, and we, we couldn't have done it without Dr. Cock and his team. There is definitely a question here that I can't answer. And it's how serious is a vitreous prolapse? Maybe Benjamin can answer that as well, because I'm sure he, he's a fountain of all kinds of knowledge. I think maybe Olivia is back. Let, let her rather answer that question. Can you hear me? Great. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, a vitreous prolapse. Yes. yes. I'm not actually sure. What, what is a vitreous prolapse? I'm not actually sure what... Okay. Um, I, I, th I think maybe it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not the right term. Um, I think so. It's, maybe, it's, maybe, maybe they mean vitreous detachment? or. Yes. Uh, okay, so in the meantime, while we're trying to get that qu question back, somebody has asked how accurate is gene testing for di 
gene testing for star gods uh, being done in the vision lab in USA. Uh, we at Retina South Africa would certainly work with our, we would work with our passion cohorts to make sure that they do go, if they go through us, that they go to a reliable laboratory. Uh, we won't mention any names on this thing, but uh, one thing, if you had a test, somebody has said, if I've had a test in a couple of years ago, do I have to uh, have another test? Well, unfortunately, or fortunately, genes don't change. So if you've had a test and you've had a good result, that is the same. We've got a question from Gail, missed some of the webinars, any info on supplements to slow the progression of age-related macular degeneration. Oh, Corin, if you'd like to feel that one. I think that's the same as we've already said. But she it? missed up it. So if you could just... Oh, oh, okay. The, the supplements that we use are products like Occuvite, and there's Occuvite Complete and Occuvite Lutein. And as I mentioned earlier, the lutein is taken if you're also on a blood thinner. And yep. then... A healthy diet is equally important or even more important with lots of green leafy vegetables. That is absolutely essential. And then last but not least, I also did mention oranges because yeah. they have found in a very big trial in um, Australia that oranges are protective of the eye, but it has to be an orange, not other citrus fruit, and it has to be the little cells in the orange. So you can't have strained fruit juice. It's got to be the actual pulp. Yeah. So well, thank you. Then we've got a comment from Leanne about Be My Eyes. It's a great app that connects you live to volunteers. It's not the only one, Leanne, but it's a brilliant app. If you go to retinasa.org.za, you can see a list of apps and it will connect you to uh, Sight Seekers. He's our guru on, on assistive devices, Anton, and you will certainly get a lot of information there. Uh, Dave Hassan says, uh, is it being recorded? Yes, it is. You will get a link to the recording. Thank you. So what about Macula Plus? Macula Plus, if I remember the product, also contains lutein, zeaxanthin, and uh, the uh, omega-3. So I think as Karen made the point uh, that it's as important to look at your diet as it is for your supplements. And in fact, I'm not a great supplement person. Uh, I think what you get from your diet is more important because you get the micronutrients mm -hmm. with it. So for example, just having vitamin C is not the same as having an orange. So exactly. I would recommend people really, and also don't take any supplements without consulting your eye care professional. Yeah. Um, so I would like to thank you all. And I'd like to hand over to Gail because we're actually over time. But do remember, there will be a recording. You will all get the link to re recording. And Retina South Africa is always available for questions. Gail at retinasa.org.za or Claudette at retinasa.org.za. And Gail, I would like to hand over to you. So if you want to unmute yourself. If she's having difficulty, then a huge thank you to Gail and her team for organizing this. Uh, Alta, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Now, Alta is part of the team. So Alta, we'd like to hand over you to officially thank everybody. We'd like to say a, a special thank you to Karen. It was a brilliant, brilliant um, presentation to um, all of the whole team, to Benjamin, to Olivia, and all our panelists uh, for answering all their questions. Um, we had a really good response, especially all the people who had the, the, the people who are participating. Thank you so much for, for uh, registering and for taking the trouble of listening to us. Uh, remember, as Claudette has said, we are always there to answer your questions. Um, Alta, um, uh, Gail, so here, Gail at retinasa.org.za and Claudette at retinasa.org.za. Thank you, Benjamin, Olivia, all of the panelists. You, were, you have been, it's been a wonderful 
and a really exciting webinar. And we look forward to a whole lot more. Thank you, yes, everybody. We would love to hear from you to hear what, what topics you want us to cover, because I think, uh, you know, the field is so wide and we really want to fulfill your needs. So we welcome ideas and questions about what you'd like to hear. And um, I want to just echo what Alta has said to all our panels, panelists for giving us your precious time. And in the end, we all want is to provide our patients with the best quality of life so they can be the best person that they can be, even though they have some vision loss. Thank you, everybody. And um, the recording is being done. So I have to, had to tell you that in the beginning, <laughs> that the recording is being done and you will get a, a link to the recording. And please, you, any of those email addresses to find out about CPD points. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you, Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Well done, Gail and Alta and Corin yeah. and to the entire PE and to Yelena and to Bayer and to uh, Techsonic for their technical help. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.